Chuck Swatsky will present Fangs of Fury today for the April Elm Fork, Texas Master Naturalist meeting. Thank you, Chuck, for being our first virtual meeting presenter or guinea pig. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Chuck became a Texas Master Naturalist in 2018, but his interest in snakes and other reptiles and amphibians began in childhood. He encountered many species of both venomous and non-venomous snakes as a young man fishing in the streams of the Ozarks in Missouri. Chuck has been featured in the March 2020 Texas Highway Magazine and provides a no-charge snake relocation service in Denton and the surrounding counties. He currently has eight snakes, which he uses in presentations and education. His favorite volunteer activities include Clear Creek City Park in Denton and Flower Mound Wild. Chuck lives in Flower Mound, Texas with his wife. They have two sons, one granddaughter, and another on the way. All right, Chuck, take it away. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, uh, yes, that was all accurate. Uh, my name is Chuck Swatsky, and uh, if you can see that first screen, I want to make sure everybody can see that, right? Yes. Okay, good. So if anyone uh, in the chapter, out of the chapter, wants to contact me, uh, you can see my uh, cell phone number and my email there at the bottom of this page. Uh, there on the uh, left here is what I look like. This is actually the picture out of the Texas Highways Magazine in March 2020. Uh, and uh, that picture in the middle there is one of my uh, relocated copperheads that I did last summer. And um, as you can see, I took some really cool photographs of him. So he is a flower mound copperhead. So this is not one that I just picked up off the internet. This is actually one of our local snakes. And hopefully he's out there making little snakes right now. Uh, depending on your outlook, I guess. Okay. So. All right, so I titled this uh, Fangs of Fury. Uh, I have done other presentations for the chapter where we covered kind of all of our uh, Texas snakes and North Texas snakes. This one is going to really uh, kind of narrow down into our venomous snakes and then really nail down our, uh, our copperheads. So uh, the uh, basically theme of this is uh, the difference between fear and appreciation is knowledge. So I know that this is a subject that not everyone is completely comfortable with, but as a master naturalist, uh, with your activities out and about, either hiking on trails or, or specifically in some of our cases, taking uh, possibly children out uh, and, and other people, I feel it's important that you have this knowledge to make sure that uh, you know, you know what you're doing out there and no one makes a mistake because although these animals are, to me, incredibly cool, uh, some of them can also be incredibly dangerous. So this is not like coming upon a, uh, a bunny rabbit or a, you know, a raccoon or a skunk, although a skunk can be kind of dangerous. All right, so um, in Texas, we have 15 venomous species and subspecies of snake, 254 counties in Texas, and believe it or not, there is not one of these counties that is snake free. Uh, where we live here in, in Denton, uh, in uh, North Texas, uh, we actually have the largest number of venomous snake species. I count eight, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and so uh, we are really in, at least for a herpetologist or a master naturalist like me that's into this, this is really an ideal place to live. So I'm very happy, maybe some of you aren't, but maybe by the end of this, you will be. So snakes are a very important part of our food web and a very important part of our ecosystem. Uh, as predators and in the food chain, snakes are both prey and snakes are both predators. So they're very important to maintain that balance. Uh, very uh, invaluable food source for our uh, birds of prey and uh, I know a lot of people ask me, well, why do we have these snakes? So I, I kind of look at it this way. You, you can imagine a water snake, for example, uh, uh, eating and uh, disposing of the diseased and dead fish in our waters and, uh, and making a meal out of that. If you can imagine how polluted some of our waterways would be 
if all these dead fish were laying around without snakes and of course other animals too that can consume them and get them out. Uh, so anyway, they provide a valuable service to us all. Snakes, of course, are especially important in the control of rodents, as are other animals. Uh, an adult rat snake uh, can consume easily uh, a few hundred, uh, if not more, uh, rats and mice per year. Rats and mice also carry a lot of ticks. And uh, when a snake eats a rodent, it also disposes of uh, many, many thousands and thousands of ticks that we have to deal with. Not to mention that rodents are especially um, troublesome to human beings, carrying many, many diseases that are fatal to humans. I have here a listing of some of them that uh, are carried by rodents. So uh, this is a uh, pro-snake presentation and an anti-rat presentation. So I <laughs> hope that's all right. So the nice thing about this, or the good thing about this, is uh, a rat may be carrying these diseases, but uh, once this snake consumes the rat, whatever disease the rat is carrying is totally wiped off the face of the earth. So none of these diseases are transmitted to a snake in the act of eating a rat. All right, so North Texas. Uh, we're going to, again, uh, drill down here into our venomous snakes that we find here in North Texas. And I actually have eight. So starting at the top left-hand side, at the top, you, know, you can see a picture of our local copperhead. And next to the copperhead is our cottonmouth. And we'll talk more about a cottonmouth. Uh, as I go from uh, to the right here, we're going to kind of talk less and less about these as we continue, but they'll, they'll, they'll still be interjected in it. Uh, next to the cottonmouth is our western diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, this guy has always been kind of the symbol of the independence of Texas, um, as we all know. And it is a beautiful but dangerous animal. And it kind of, it kind of, as I said, it kind of, it kind of reflects Texas. Um, and then next to it is probably my favorite rattlesnake is our timber rattlesnake. Uh, and then on the bottom left. Uh, we have our Texas coral snake, which we will talk about. And then the next two are very small snakes that are seldom run into, but they do range within our uh, ecosystem or within our part of North Texas. Uh, the one in the center of their bottom is called a pygmy rattlesnake. It's a very small rattlesnake, but don't underestimate its, its uh, punch. And next to the uh, pygmy rattlesnake is a Masasagua rattlesnake. The Masasagua is really under pressure because of habitat destruction. Very interesting snake because this snake ranges not only in Texas, but all the way through the Midwest and actually up into Ontario, Canada. So it has a very large range. It is probably the next snake going on the endangered list. Okay, so when we talk about uh, our venomous snakes here, uh, we primarily are concerned about the family called Viperdae, and it is a subfamily uh, called a Crotalidae or a Crotalid. I'm gonna go back to this later to tell you why this is important, but uh, just so you know, we're gonna kind of refer to this this name, uh, Crotalid or Crotalidae, uh, a bit. So you'll you'll see that. And then listed here again, you can see our copperhead, our cottonmouth, our water moccasin. They're on the uh, below the uh, copperhead. This is the same snake. So if you encounter a copperhead, you are encountering a water moccasin. They're not two separate snakes. Again, our western diamondback, our timber rattlesnake, our pygmy rattlesnake, and our Massasagua rattlesnake. Okay, so the family Viperdae uh, gives us a family of what we call pit vipers. So I call that putting the pit in the pit viper. So you see the picture there, it says the venomous snakes of North Texas. And we show uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So seven of these eight that are displayed here 
belong to our Viper Day family and our pit vipers. Uh, the one on the bottom right is our Texas Carl snake, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, that is not a pit viper. And we'll talk about what this means now. So the, the name pit refers to a heat sensing pit. And this pit, it's located about midway between the snake's eyes and nostril. And this is a thermal receptor. Uh, it allows the snake to detect different temperature ranges, especially in warm blooded animals, such as a mouse. It's a very ingenious organ. As you can imagine, if you're trying to find something to eat and you have no arms or no legs, it becomes a little bit of a challenge. So uh, this uh, heat sensing pit allows the snake to be able to find its prey a little bit easier. And plus some other things that uh, are inherent in these types of snakes, including the ability to have venom uh, when, they're, when they're searching out food. Here's a couple of pictures of the pit we're gonna look at. Uh, the one on the left here is a copperhead and I've circled it there. You can see the pit. That's what it looks like, very good close up. On the cottonmouth here on the right, uh, the pit is right there. It's a little bit harder to see, uh, but it is there. And again, so all these snakes in the Viper Day family will contain in this pit. On the western diamondback rattlesnake, you can see it there on the left. And on the timber rattlesnake, you can see it there on the right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to, Mike, do, do we have any questions? No, not yet. Okay. So feel free to ask a question if you'd like. Okay. So here's a fun fact we have uh, over 100 species and subspecies of snakes. In Texas, only 14 of those are medically significant venomous species. I use the word medically significant, okay? We also have medically insignificant snakes, and those snakes also produce venom as well. So we have medically significant and we have medically insignificant. Uh, and so what I wanna show you here is here on the right, I am holding a copperhead. Uh, notice I'm using the proper tools uh, because it is a, a dangerous pit viper. On the right here, and I, well, there are some of these kind of pictures, by the way, of uh, some of these kind of results of an unfortunate event that this type of pit viper would bite you. So this is a medically significant snake, meaning that if you get bit, you need to go to the hospital. Okay, the one on the left is a medically insignificant hospital. The story behind this one is I was at the Dallas Arboretum and my wife and I were walking around and lo and behold, there was a beautiful Texas garter snake sitting right by the walk. And me being me, I had to pick that snake up. Okay, I don't recommend that for, for anyone else. But I had to pick this snake up and you can see in the picture that it actually is latched onto my knuckle, okay? Now it didn't hurt and it made my knuckle bleed a little bit, uh, but I want you to understand that a, a garter snake, even though it's a medically insignificant snake, it still contains venom. And some people can have a reaction to this, uh, just as you might be allergic to something else like a bee or something else. So we do have several snakes that are venomous, but are medically insignificant in Texas. Another one would be our Western hognose snake, which you see here on the bottom left. So uh, they contain venom. And in this case, if you're a toad or a frog, that is bad news. If you're a human being, that's really not that bad, okay? Uh, so anyway, medically insignificant and medically significant snakes. So just keep that in mind. Uh, again, talking about a medically insignificant snake, on the left here, if I was bitten by, let's say, a rat snake, this would pretty much be on the left here uh, what it would look like. You're probably going to bleed a little bit and you're going to scab like this. Snakes have teeth uh, and you don't need to do anything about it. You need to wash it off with soap and water. 
And uh, just like any other scrape or cut that you have, it has the possibility of becoming infected just because of what you're exposed to and how clean you keep it. But the snake itself very rarely, if ever, causes an infection. Uh, on the right here, you would see what it might look like if you were actually bitten by a pit viper. So you can see quite, quite a bit of a difference here. Uh, keep in mind that if you do unfortunately encounter a copperhead and get bitten, you might have these two fang marks, you might have one fang mark, you might have a scratch. Um, a lot of this is when people kill a copperhead and sometimes they make the mistake of picking, uh, cutting the head off of the darn thing. Um, even just a little scratch from that fang is enough for it to introduce venom into your body. So this is why we call this a medically significant snake and it would look something like this. Okay. So in the world of medicine, we uh, luckily have a, a drug which we call antivenom. This is a counteractant to you getting bitten by a snake. What I show here is a very simplified uh, uh, graph or flowchart here of actually what happens. Because I know all of you have heard the word antivenom. Not all of you probably know what actually happens. So here's what's what actually happens. So the, the snake in this case, on the far left, we see a rattlesnake here being milked for its venom. And the venom is taken and it is then injected into an animal. And it is usually a horse or a sheep or a pig. And that animal then um, develops antibodies to the venom. In this day and age with what we're all dealing with today with coronavirus, we all understand antibodies, right? So these uh, animals are slowly injected with the snake venom, they build up antibodies and the scientists then remove their blood, uh, do their uh, processing and remove the chemicals that uh, we need. And they make a product called antivenom. There's a picture of it there at the bottom. And we'll talk a little bit about more of that in the next slide. And if you are unfortunate enough to be bit by a venomous snake like a copperhead, uh, what you see on the far right is a bag of saline that uh, includes uh, antivenom. And this is how the antivenom is given to you. So it is an intravenous drip that comes down and drips into your body. And that will counteract and help flush out the venom that is running through your bloodstream. All right, so again, I'm going to go back here to antivenom. And remember, I told you about the word crotalidae or crotalid uh, and the family viperdae. So today, there are two uh, antivenoms on the market. And I'm going to kind of explain to you what they are. On the left here is a relatively new antivenom that's out on the market called Anavip. It is manufactured by a Mexican company. And at the present day, uh, it is available and FDA approved only for envenomations by rattlesnakes. And what you're going to notice here is the word crotalidae on the box. Okay. So on both boxes, you're going to see the word crotalidae. Okay. The other thing you notice is that underneath the word crotalidae immune, you see the word equine. That means that this is derived from a horse. And so that is where the antibodies came from. And a very interesting thing and why this is a very interesting new development is this is a process called FAB2. And what we're meaning by that that you see on the box here is the size of the molecules of this antivenom. And what's good about that is when this antivenom is, is introduced into your body, due to the fact that the molecules of the antivenom are larger, it will stay in your body a longer period of time doing its work. In theory, allowing you to receive less antivenom than you normally would because it's gonna stay in your bloodstream for a longer period of time. 
The one on the left is from a company called Crofab. Crofab is the go-to anti-venom these days. Uh, and it has been on the market and FDA approved, I think from around the year 2000. Again, you see the word crotalidae. So what does that mean? That means that this is effective for all of our pit vipers that we have in the United States, okay? You see the word polyvalent. Polyvalent means, means many, okay? So that means that this is going to work regardless of whether you are bitten by a copperhead, a cottonmouth, or a rattlesnake, okay? Also, you see the word ovine. What does that mean? That is telling us that this antivenom was derived from sheep rather than a horse. And also you see the word fab. So fab and fab two, the molecules of crofab are smaller than the molecules in anavip. Therefore, the crofab is not gonna remain in your system as long. Therefore, you most likely are going to need more of this antivenom than you might need with the other one. Now, you notice that the picture on the left, uh, you can see it better. When this arrives in the hospital, it is freeze dried. And so what's gonna happen is the, the uh, medical personnel are going to inject saline into this bottle and shake it, not shake it, but kind of like move it back and forth until it constitutes. And then that's gonna be put into the uh, intravenous bag. And again, that's what goes into your, into your arm. So sometimes you hear people say, well, I got, you know, 50 vials of antivenom or 10 vials of antivenom. So when we talk about vials, this is what we're talking about, okay? And then that is all put into the, into the bag and that's how you receive it, okay? Any questions? Can you all still hear me? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I didn't have the mute. Uh, unmuted on mine. Okay. Uh, first question, which I think you already alluded to, is the antivenom snake per species specific? Right. One question. Okay. Uh, you want me to just uh, let me answer that one? So, yeah, so uh, the answer to your question is it, is it is not species specific for pit vipers. So, this is why, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, when you go to the hospital, uh, you do not need to know which snake bit you because this crow fab is going to be used regardless of what bites you. If you happen to go to the hospital and the physician or the emergency room uh, attendants or whoever is attending you says, I need to know whether this is a copperhead, cottonmouth, or rattlesnake that bit you, that is not true. This is why the crow fab on the right is called a polyvalent because it will work for all species of uh, crotalid. Okay, next question is, do most EMTs or hospitals carry the antivenom in stock? Some of them do, some of them don't. However, it is readily available uh, all throughout uh, many different hospitals. So keep in mind that although you've been bitten by a snake, it is not, usually a event that causes death. So for you to get the antivenom, uh, first of all, a bunch of stuff's gonna happen before you actually get the antivenom. You know, and I'm gonna actually cover that uh, with time remaining. So because, because for me, it, it's helpful to know which hospitals carry it and which hospitals don't. But uh, for example, I'm in Flower Mound, so Flower Mount Presby carries antivenom. Uh, but if they didn't, it would be very easy to get it. So it's, it's readily available. Okay, a couple uh, related questions. Uh, one is, is the rattlesnake vaccine for dogs good against all pit vipers? And then another one, what uh, is the treatment available for pets bitten by venomous snakes? Okay, so to answer that question, we. Regarding a pet, let's say a dog, what is being referred to there is not antivenom, I don't think. 
so so there's two there's two things there's anti venom and anti venom for a dog is is uh valuable just as it would be for a human there also is a rattlesnake vaccine that is available for dogs okay the rattlesnake vaccine for dogs is totally ineffective and a waste of money this is because when you normally receive a vaccine, uh, you are given antibodies and let's, let's say the flu, for example, you get a flu shot, a vaccine. Uh, it is kind of designed to slowly uh, counteract the effects of the disease that's entering your body. The problem with the rattlesnake vaccine is when you are bitten by a venomous snake, all of the venom is introduced to your body at once and quickly. And be, you know, just by getting a vaccine, it cannot respond quickly enough to be able to counteract what's going on. So, so the, the vaccines are, 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 are kind of designed to uh, react with what is slowly being brought into your bloodstream or into your body while the anti where the venom it's a rush it's all in there at once so generally uh and and with every uh medical document i've read about rattlesnake vaccine it is not effective and don't waste your money on it uh, okay now anti-venom a different story because anti-venom is counteracting uh, a medical emergency a vaccine is is kind of a preventative measure, but to answer that it is not effective. So don't don't even don't even bother with it. Uh, what was the other question? I'm sorry about the the treatment for vet for uh, dogs. For, yeah, treatment for pets. That okay, have been so as I said, the, the the treatment would be to to get to the emergency room vet and to receive anti venom. Uh, we will talk a little bit later here about different kind of bites, but. Uh, you know, anti venom is is the that's the only thing that's going to work on the venom. Now, a lot of people will carry with them out in the field or give them dogs a Benadryl. Okay, uh, Benadryl does absolutely nothing to counteract a venomous snake bite. This is because Benadryl is a antihistamine, uh, and when you receive venom from a snake there is no histamine introduced into your body. So it, it actually does nothing. The only thing it does do is possibly make people feel better mentally because they feel like they've done something. But medically speaking, Benadryl is of no use. Now, if you were to have an allergic reaction, uh, an anaphylactic reaction to either venom or anti-venom, which is very, very rare, but it does happen, and you're in the hospital, the treatment for an anaphylactic reaction to either one is epinephrine, an epi shot. Uh, the treatment is not a Benadryl. So uh, can Benadryl, if you were to receive an infection and break out in hives, maybe help you just a very little bit? I think it would be insignificant. So that that is a, a common misconception that you should give your pet or yourself Benadryl when you receive a venomous snake bite. I hope okay. I answered. Well, yeah, one last question. Yep. Uh, is there a difference between anticoagulant venom versus neurotoxin venom? Uh, yeah, and we'll talk about that in a minute if you just give me a second. So. Um, and actually, I'll actually talk about that right now. Uh, when we talk about neurotoxicity, uh, we're talking about one snake here in Texas, which is our Texas coral snake. That is a neurotoxic snake. That is actually the most dangerous snake in Texas. Fortunately, it is also the snake responsible for the least amount of snake bites in Texas, maybe 100 or 200 a year total. Uh, and actually, that's probably the United States, take that back. So that in the entire United States, we may be talking about 200 envenomations. There is and was an anti-venom for Texas coral snakes and Florida coral snakes. Uh, 
and it is it was no longer manufactured. It was stopped. The manufacture of that antivenom was stopped. Uh, there is a lot of it available, and because there are so few envenomations, again, there's a lot of stock of it. So what's happening is the expiration date on the uh, Texas carl snake antivenom has expired and the FDA just keeps extending the date for the expiration of the antivenom. Okay. Having said that, in my research and discussions with different toxicologists, uh, if you are bitten by a carl snake and you get to the hospital, you very rarely, if ever, receive any antivenom anyway. This is because the neurotoxic venom is first of all, not gonna cause any massive tissue destruction like you would see if you were bitten by a copperhead or a cottonmouth or a rattlesnake because of the hemotoxicity of that venom. Hemo means blood. And so it's a blood destroying, tissue destroying uh, venom. A Texas carl snake's neurotoxicity what it's going to do is it's going to affect your nervous system. And uh, the ultimate result of this is your brain will not send a message to your body that you need to breathe and your diaphragm won't con contract and you won't breathe and you will die. However, if you're in the hospital, you will be put on a ventilator and that will keep you alive until the venom dissipates from your body. Now, this day and age today, with our ventilator problem, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what would happen. Uh, so to, to answer that question, uh, so uh, yes, there is a difference between neurotoxicity and hemotoxicity and how it's treated. Okay, and whether you answer this now or later in the presentation, somebody's wondering if you would recommend a snake ID app. Uh, we'll be getting to that, yes. So that's, that's later on. All right, that's it for now. Okay, moving on. Uh, oh, look at this. So this is our Texas Carl snake that we just talked about, the most dangerous snake in Texas. This is our Texas Cobra. So this Texas Carl snake is actually a Cobra. It is a very, very close relative to things like, I have pictured here, a Mozambique spinning Cobra, a King Cobra, a forest Cobra, a black mamba, a green mamba. These guys are all close cousins. So uh, when somebody uh, says, well, I'm glad that we're not in Africa, we don't have a cobra. Well, actually we do have a cobra and it's called the Texas coral snake. Uh, so again, uh, this is a very small snake. Uh, it is uh, not a pit viper. So if you look closely at this, it, it's called a, a lapidae or an elipid. And again, uh, this snake carries a neurotoxic venom as opposed to our crotalids that we referred to before, which would be carrying a uh, hemotoxic venom. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule. There is one really nasty snake here in Texas and to the west that we're not talking about today called the Mojave rattlesnake. And that guy is a mixture of just about everything. So it contains neurotoxicity, it contains hemotoxicity, and a lot of other nasty stuff. That's one of the exceptions to the rule, and it is also a pit viper. But that one particular species is, 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 is very, uh, a very troublesome snake. So, but anyway, this is our Texas coral snake, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about where we would find these in a minute. Okay, we're gonna talk about the copperhead now, and this is basically how we're gonna narrow this down a little bit. Uh, in Texas, we have two species or subspecies here of copperhead. One is called the eastern copperhead and one is called the broadband copperhead. Uh, the, uh, tax, tax, uh, the taxonomy name here is Agkistrodon contortrix. Okay. Uh, Interesting translation is agkistrodon in the Latin translated to English stands for hooked tooth. And contartrix in Latin to English stands for contarded or twisted. Uh, so that's where these Latin names come from and how they describe these snakes. 
Now, in the past, there were five subspecies of copperhead uh, in the United States. And I don't know if I can remember them all, but there was the Osage copperhead, kind of like up in the uh, southern Missouri, Kansas area, the Trans-Pecos copperhead in the west of Texas, the southern copperhead, uh, the broadband copperhead, and I, there might have been, there was another one. So the way this works is as we get better and better at understanding genetics, uh, the scientists are always narrowing down these classifications. And this is what has happened in this case. So today, it's generally acknowledged that there are only two subspecies of copperhead in the United States, not five. And those two are now the eastern copperhead and the broadband copperhead. Obviously, you can see the differences here. We'll talk about that a little bit here. Where we are in Denton County and where I'm in in Flower Mound, the one at the right, the broadband copperhead, is primarily what we are going to find here in our part of Texas. As we move from Denton County East, we're gonna start running into this Eastern Copperhead. And this Eastern Copperhead will predominate from uh, East Texas all the way up to, uh, and you'll see a map in a minute, all the way up into Virginia and uh, Maryland and some of those states and most of the Eastern United States. Uh, okay, uh, we have uh, juvenile, juvenile copperheads, uh, baby copperheads, and as you'll see the one on the uh, top left here is a juvenile eastern copperhead, and you will notice uh, a little yellow tail there on the baby copperhead. To the right here is a photo of two northern cottonmouths, and you will see that uh, the one on the left there, and actually the other one too, you can barely see it. They also uh, exhibit this very yellow tail when they are born. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but this is basically a caudal lure, we call this. And this is what the snake will use to lure a, a toad or a lizard or some other small animal into its strike range while that animal thinks it's trying to go after some other kind of food like a caterpillar or a worm. Uh, you will notice the difference here between the markings of the copperhead and the and the cottonmouth, especially as babies. So if you look at the uh, cottonmouth on the right, you'll see a very jagged, um, almost looks like an, a, a Christmas tree there, doesn't it, on the side of the snake? And if you look at the copperhead, you'll see a very smooth pattern that comes down on the sides of its marking. So that is one dead giveaway. Uh, when we talk about copperheads, uh, the juvenile copperhead will look quite similar to the adult. However, after a year or so, maybe two years, they will lose that yellow tail and it will blacken. Uh, that is not in every single case. Some of them keep some of the yellow tail, but for the most part, that thing will, will dissipate and it'll, it'll kind of turn dark. But the snake will actually look pretty much the same as a baby as it does in, as an adult. That is not the case with the cottonmouth. The cottonmouth will darken considerably and we'll see some of these photos and you won't be able to really see these at all. So this question comes up all the time. Do I have a cottonmouth or do I have a copperhead? My friends at uh, Clear Creek will know that we encountered a couple cottonmouths out there. Uh, and uh, so they are very prevalent here. Okay, talking about the copperhead again, back to the copperhead. This is the range map that, that you, sh you would see for the United States between the eastern copperhead to the east and the broadband copperhead to the west. I kind of made a circle here on Texas, kind of representing approximately where we live. And you can see that we are predominantly in the broadband copperhead range where we are. And then we have an intermixing uh, between the broadband and the eastern where we see uh, quite a population of hybrids. These snakes are able to breed with each other. Uh, actually, by the way, get asked the question all the time, uh, you know, can a rat snake and a copperhead breed? And the answer to that question is no. That would be the same as a dog and a cat uh, breeding. Uh, so that is a completely different species. So they cannot breed. But in this case, we just have the same species. So an Eastern copperhead and a broadband copperhead could breed together. 
and we get kind of a hybrid copperhead out of that. So as you can see, the uh, eastern to the uh, east of the United States, you can see that it will range all the way up into New York, uh, parts of Connecticut, uh, pretty high up there to the north. That looks like Delaware, Rhode Island, and some of those states up there. And then all the way over to uh, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and interestingly enough, uh, not in Florida. Uh, these uh, maps, by the way, are for reference only. So that doesn't mean that uh, if there's a white area, there's not a copperhead. Uh, but this is just for general information. And of course, a lot of this is based on actual reported sightings. Okay. Chuck, a couple of questions. Yep, go ahead. Uh, do all pit vipers have the same rate of dry bites? And what is that ratio? We see uh, about 25% of snake venomous snake bites are dry bites. Um, you know, that is kind of left up to the snake. So uh, individuals have different personalities, believe it or not. So uh, yeah, so it is possible that you will get bit by a snake. Uh, understanding that venom for a venomous snake is a very precious resource. It's kept in reserve so that they can use it to eat. And the last thing they want to do is bite you. Uh, it's kind of a last resort. So uh, we will, I, I do have more information on that too. But a snake will try to flee. Uh, a snake will put up a def defensive um, stance. Some snakes will either also strike at you but not open their mouth. They'll just bump you with their nose just to give you the message. Okay. Uh, as a last resort, the snake might bite you uh, and it may not pass any venom to you. And again, that's called a dry bite. Probably 25% of uh, occurrences are dry bites. And as a last resort, you're going to be a last resort. You're going to be envenomated. All right. And then one other question is: How long do these snakes live in the wild? Uh, quite a long time. Uh, I'd say 15 years or so. So they have quite a long lifespan. I had a, another question from someone on an iPhone. Yep. That they had heard of two horses dying from rattlesnake bites. Uh -huh. And um, are so rattlesnakes or any of the snakes especially dangerous to horses? Well, uh, so e each snake, each snake is in, in the scientific community, uh, the, the, uh, the study is called LD50, and they rank the, the uh, toxicity and venom of each snake uh, throughout the world. They do this by taking a bunch of mice, and uh, they kind of, uh, then they, uh, they study for each snake uh, how many mice die from the bite. And that's how they kind of rank the venom. So uh, if you want to look at uh, yes, a rattlesnake would be a more dangerous snake than would be a copperhead or a cottonmouth, okay? Uh, a copperhead would generally be considered a less toxic venomous snake than a copperhead, but we're basically splitting hairs there between a copperhead and a cottonmouth. They're essentially the same snake, okay? Uh, there is a very slight difference in the toxicity of their venom. Rattlesnake bite, depending on the species of rattlesnake, would be a step further uh, in, uh, I guess, toxicity and dangerous, uh, you know, uh, venomous bite than would be these guys here that you see. So yes, now animals, the larger the animal, the, the better they're able to tolerate the venom. It's possible that an animal such as a dog or a horse could be bit around the face area or the neck area, which could swell and restrict their, uh, their windpipe and their ability to breathe. Generally speaking, horses are able to withstand the venom uh, pretty well, but that's not to say that, yes, unfortunately, some of them may die from that. Okay, another couple of questions. Sure. Uh, any homing instinct in snakes? 
Well, this is a kind of a uh, controversial issue. As many of you know, I uh, will uh, go capture a, uh, a, a, cot a, a, a copperhead. I actually have one here in my house now, believe it or not. Thanks to, uh, <laughs> thanks to one of our members there. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so there, there's a little bit of uh, a controversy of uh, if you remove a snake and you put it somewhere else, it has a homing instinct to go back to its home range. So we try, if we're going to move a snake from your yard and put it somewhere else where it is uh, relatively safe from being in any contact with human beings, uh, we try not to move that snake more than a mile or two away from where we got it. Uh, both for the survivability of the snake. Uh, so, uh, yes, in general speaking, they supposedly have their own ranges and they supposedly can find their way back. And that's why we try to relocate them as close as we can to where we got them. So, like, I wouldn't take a copperhead and move it to Florida, for example. Okay. Uh, someone read that copperheads are described as ambush predators. Would I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to cover that. Okay. And then somebody else has asked, is there any way to discourage copperheads from wanting to live in close proximity to people? I'm going they to are out in the country. I'm and in addition to finding them in leaves, we find them in outbuildings, flower pots, garages, etc. Yep, that's, that's coming up here. So just let me continue. Okay, then one last one. Uh, nope. Nope. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so here we have uh, the adult copperhead. Here we have the adult cottonmouth. And remember, I talked about the baby cottonmouth. Well, here you uh, clearly can see how the adult will change and how the adult copperhead pretty much stays the same, other than the yellow tail uh, that the juvenile may have. So one of the characteristics that at least I always look for. And I, I'm kind of like in, in my education, you know, I, I've been around a lot of people like I'm driving in the car and the guy will say, hey, look at that Ford over there. Or look at that Chevy way over there. Well, how do you know that's a Ford or a Chevy? Well, I just know it because I just know what a Chevy is. I'm kind of like that too with snakes. So I can see a cottonmouth from 50 yards and I know it's a cottonmouth just because I know it. Uh, but that's just me. So here's a picture of the cottonmouth and one of the characteristics that, uh, that can you, can you see my mouse move by the way? Yes. Okay. So one of the characteristics here that, that I always look, uh, that you always want to look at on a cottonmouth is you can see this dark mask that goes from the end of the snake's head and this line that continues on all the way up through its eye. You guys see that? So uh, that mask is a dead giveaway here that you have a cottonmouth, okay? Uh, obviously it's gonna be dark, uh, the adults are. W one of the things about cottonmouths also is they spend a, a good amount of their time in swamps and watery places and muddy places. So a lot of times you might see a cottonmouth and it might be covered in mud. So, so sometimes it might be kind of hard to distinguish one of these guys uh, if you're not used to looking at them. But if you're able to see this mask here that goes all the way up uh, along the side of its face and through its eye, that will, that's a dead giveaway here that you have a cotton mouth, okay? You can see conversely on the, on the copper head, we don't, we don't have that at all, just this light color. And so that is really the two differences here between them. Several other things that you can look at. One of the things is there's this ridge here above the eye of the cottonmouth that kind of protrudes and prevents you from seeing the eye, especially when you're looking from the top of the snake. You don't really see that as much here in the copperhead. So two different uh, snakes, essentially the same snake, just a little bit different, but uh, Something that uh, again is very common here between the northern cottonmouth and the cottonmouth and the copperhead. Okay, on to uh, when we talk about the cottonmouth or water moccasin. This is the range. 
uh, today of the cottonmouth water moccasin. I again made a little circle here of where we're uh, approximately at here in North Texas. So you can see that we land uh, pretty much in the range of the cottonmouth. And it uh, ranges up all the way up to southern central Illinois. That's probably the furthest northern region of it. And then all through the southern states and then all the way up here into Virginia. And so uh, this is why I say that we have eight venomous species of snakes here in Texas and North Texas. So, um, you know, we always seem to land in the, in the good range. Uh, here on the bottom left is a photo that I took of a cottonmouth and you might be able to see a little X right here. This is on the Missouri southern border and this is where I was when I took this photo. Uh, and I'm going to attempt to run a video here, Mike. I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, I want to see if this works. This is kind of a test. So if this is not running, it's running on my screen. I want to make sure it is. This is that snake right here. This is a cottonmouth in a swamp about a half mile from the Mississippi River on the Missouri-Illinois border. I am with my GoPro camera and I'm crawling on my stomach here through these little uh, thistle bushes here. This is about five or six feet from the road. Now a lot of people say that these snakes will chase you down and try to kill you. I am literally three feet from this cottonmouth with my GoPro camera. I have a little handheld GoPro and I'm holding my arm out. And you can see that this snake is just sitting here. This is a highly venomous cottonmouth. It is not concerned about me at all. Uh, I'm smart enough not to try to touch it or pick it up. But you can see I'm no way in disturbing the snake and it is in no hurry to get out of my way. So, you know, the theory that this snake is dangerous, yes, it is dangerous. But I just want to make the point that these snakes will not chase you down and try to kill you or attack you. And that is a very common myth that we see out here about uh, all these snakes. Uh, this was a pretty exhilarating, as you can imagine, opportunity for me. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, there is your basic cottonmouth out in the wild. And you can see a little bit of the road here and how far he is from the road. Did that play okay, Mike? Kind of step through, but I, I think people got what. Okay, the, yeah, what I, I kind of did that. That was, that was kind of a test. I just want to see if it worked. Okay, so uh, this came up the other day. Um, so uh, this is titled uh, "I am not a cottonmouth or a water moccasin." These are two of our very common uh, North Texas water snakes. Unfortunately, continually. Uh, mistaken and killed with the mistaken identity of being a cottonmouth. So 99.9% .9 of the time when someone comes to me and says, I have a cottonmouth in the pond, uh, and they show me a picture, this is what they're looking at. So on the left here, we have an adult plain-bellied water snake. On the right, we have an adult diamondback water snake. Uh, so because they're in the water, everyone continually uh, automatically assumes that these are cottonmouths. Uh, the question may come up, uh, how do I identify these snakes? And we hear all the time, well, if it has a triangle head, it's a venomous snake. If it doesn't have a triangle head, uh, it is a non-venomous snake. I can tell you that that is a very dangerous uh, feature to depend on, and we should not use that. So in, you can see on this picture on the left, we have a plain-bellied water snake who is assuming a defensive posture and the first thing that this snake is doing is puffing its head up to make its head appear to be triangular so that the unsuspecting predator, our human being, also a predator, uh, thinks twice before it tries to do anything to this snake. So it is trying to mimic a dangerous snake here by uh, making the impression here that it is a venomous snake. So as you can see here, the unknowing person would look at this and go, Oh my God, there's a cottonmouth. Uh, you also will notice on both of these snakes, especially 
on the one on the left, the lines, the vertical lines that come across its lip here, okay, and come down all the way from the tip of its nose back. When you see these vertical lines coming down on the lips of the snake here, uh, this is a non-venomous snake. You will see the same thing on the uh, uh, diamondback water snake. It's only a little bit harder to see in that picture. So these are completely harmless, valuable snakes. And I mentioned before, these guys will clean out the dead and diseased fish out of the ponds so that these ponds don't get polluted with you know, dead tissue and things like that. And so they're very valuable snakes. And they can get quite large, so that's why they're pretty scary to a lot of people. But these are completely harmless. And again, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, so here are the bands on the mouth of the water snake, as you can see them coming down from the top down to the lip and below. And here we see the cotton mouth, and this is the mask I was talking about before, where if you see this going from the back of the head and all the way up through the eye, you have yourself a cotton mouth, okay? No bars, okay? So Chuck, someone did ask, how big do cotton mouth and copper heads get? Uh, we'll cover that, but generally, uh, these are relatively small snakes. Uh, here in Texas, a three feet, uh, a three foot copperhead or cottonmouth, at least in that range, is going to be a pretty good size cottonmouth. Uh, generally, uh, when I'm out uh, on uh, snake calls, I'm seeing copperheads that are within a foot and a half to two feet, two and a half feet, not much bigger than that. Uh, they, they can get bigger than that in other regions. For example, a Florida cottonmouth is going to be much, much bigger than we would find here in Texas. They are uh, stout, I would call stout, or fat, uh, for lack of a better word, fat snakes. So, you know, meaty snakes. Uh, and also, if you're looking at a cottonmouth, you'll see a tail. The tail will be pretty tapered uh, off into a It'll be fat and it'll taper very quickly into a, a very skinny tail. And I don't know if I have a good picture of that or not. But generally, um, we're looking at between, you know, two to three feet for, for an adult. And I'm finding babies that are uh, between a foot and a foot and a half, something like that. Okay, just uh, for grins, we're going to talk a little bit about the ranges of the rattlesnakes here in Texas. So on the left here, you see the range map of the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. And I circled again approximately where we're at here in Denton County. One thing that you have to understand is that the green sections here indicate uh, reported sightings of these snakes in whatever particular county they are reported. <clears throat> the orange uh, areas are just showing counties that have reported new sightings. And just because a area is white and doesn't report any sightings, like you see here in the circle, does not mean that there are no diamondback rattlesnakes in that county. It just means that no one has reported one. So my suspicion is, if you look at the surrounding counties here, uh, and I don't know whether this is Denton County or not that I have circled here, it's gonna be close. So just because this shows a totally white square in that county does not mean that no Western diamondback rattlesnakes exist. And actually, <coughs> I know they do exist because we found them. So, uh, so just because it's not filled in, th this is just a reference, okay? And that is Denton County. Okay. On the right, uh, we show our timber rattlesnake. Uh, this is, uh, I believe still is today, a protected snake in the state of Texas. So you are not allowed in any way to pick up or harass or do anything to this snake at all. It is a protected species. The game warden will want to talk to you if you do. Um, so if you can imagine here putting this western diamondback rattlesnake map and the timber rattlesnake map together, uh, you're going to see a lot of green here in the state of Texas. So this indicates that pretty much wherever you go in the state of Texas, in any county, you stand a pretty darn good chance of running into a rattlesnake of some kind, okay? Uh, the question, 
Yes. Um, actually, there's an error there. At the bottom of that screen, it says Echisterdon piscivorus. This is incorrect. I should have changed that. Echisterdon piscivorus is a cottonmouth. And once again, this is again interesting to me, Echisterdon stands for hooked tooth, and the word piscivorus stands for fish eater. So if you translate this Latin name for this snake, it stands for a hooked tooth fish eater. How about that? Okay, what's the question? Uh, what are the habitats of each of these two rattlesnakes, and are we more likely to where are we more likely to come across them? Uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, so these, these snakes are just like any other animal. Uh, they're out searching for food. Okay. So, you know, we, as you can see, the, if you look at the, the map of Texas, we know we have, I believe it's 11 ecosystems or eco regions in the state of Texas. So pick one. Okay. And, and you're going to find a rattlesnake. So whether you're in the Trans-Pecos, you know, whether you're in cross timbers, you know, whether you're in the pine, pine wood forests, you're going to find a habitat that are, are going to hold these snakes. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's basically where you're going to find them everywhere. Scrub brush, you're going to find them in forests, you're going to find them everywhere. Okay, any more? Any more? Yeah, there is one more. Okay. Uh, how can I find a person to humanely remove snakes from their neighborhood? They are in Harris County. They're in and Harris. How can I learn, or how can I learn to be that person? Uh, well, my my advice, first of all, is to find out as much as you can about our native stakes. So you really need to be able to identify and understand what, what you have. In Harris County, which is Houston, um, there are uh, a number of, uh, there are a number of uh, relocators all over the state of Texas. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Hey, get out of here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so my, Probably advice to start out is, and I have some of this later too, is to get on the, the what kind of snake uh, is this education site on Facebook. If you want a snake removed, and of course I, I, I'm not going to Houston because by the time I got down there, your snake would be gone and there, there's plenty of people down there that do this kind of work. Uh, but you can put on that site, hey, I found this snake, what is it? Can somebody help me? Uh, remove it and you'll get responses like crazy from all kinds of people that are willing to come to your place and, and remove the snake. Uh, if you wanted to remove them at all, uh, I would find somebody to, to uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, jump onto, you know, that does this and kind of spend a little bit of time with them and make sure that you understand, you know, the proper equipment and tools you need to, to get involved with this. Um, and, uh, you know, again, just learn as much as you possibly can. Okay. Okay, going back to cotton mouths. Yep. Uh, do they catch and eat live fish? They do. Uh, they are also very well-known snake eaters. Uh, uh, they will pretty much eat anything. So, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, another, another myth is, uh, uh, water snakes swim under the water, cottonmouths swim on top of the water, or venomous snakes swim on top of the water. Well, cottonmouths eat fish, and I very rarely find a fish on top of the water. So, you know, cottonmouths are just as likely to swim under the water as a water snake is going to swim under the water. So, yes, cottonmouths will eat uh, frogs, they'll eat fish. Uh, and they'll eat any other snake that happens to come their way. Okay. Okay, uh, if you have another one, let me know. So moving on, uh, again, what uh, we're trying to uh, uh, enforce here or try to uh, give you the idea is uh, we, we also have a lot of rattlesnakes here in Texas. Here's the range for the pygmy rattlesnake. So here we fill in quite a bit of uh, 
you know, south up to the east, uh, unto North Texas. Again, there's Denton County. That does not mean we do not have pygmy rattlesnakes here. Uh, and then our Massasauga rattlesnake. Again, same thing. They're kind of spread out throughout Texas. This is a good example of this is a fairly hard rattlesnake to find. And this is why uh, I think many of the counties are not filled in here because it's not something that you normally would see. They're there, but you probably don't know they're there. So my guess is this range map would be a lot greener uh, filled in, in in truth than you see here, okay? So take away from this, uh, we have a lot of rattlesnakes, okay? A Here's our question, a question on that previous map is yeah. what are the orange and blue colors on that map? Yeah, those, those just indicate uh, that those sightings are, are relatively new and the map hasn't been updated yet. So when the map gets updated, if it gets updated, uh, all those things will turn green showing that, that the, so it's just the, whenever they get around to updating this, everything will turn out, everything will just show the, the green spots for places they found this snake. Okay, and then uh, another question about uh, snake removers. Uh, yeah. Do they need to, or do you need to know if they have insurance? Uh, well, mine is, mine is, uh, you, you have your, your, you have your hospitalization, you have your regular insurance. So, you know, mine is, you know, I, I don't, I don't take any money from anybody for a snake removal. So it is totally a, a volunteer community service and uh, it would, <laughs> you know, I, it hasn't happened to me yet, okay? So I, I, would, uh, I would apply for that on my current insurance if I were happen to have to go to the hospital. Insurance covers snake bite, uh, so it's not, you know, don't worry. Yeah, not I wonder, don't worry. I it's an individual choice, I guess the word is. Well, I think the person was wondering, should you, ensure that they have liability insurance if they're coming onto your property and that, you know, doing work? Uh, that's an answer probably not for me to answer. That's something you probably need to check with your, with your financial people or your insurance people, but uh, you can certainly buy, I'm sure you can buy some kind of insurance. If someone happens to come on your property and get bitten, uh, I guess that could be a liability to you. Uh, but uh, I, I personally don't, I personally don't have anything other than my hosp my current hospitalization. Okay. Okay. Uh, Texas coral snake. This is the map for Texas coral snake. You can see uh, heavily populated in our southern uh, part of Texas, all the way to the Mexican border. And uh, you can see a proliferation of uh, Texas Carl moving into uh, east, northeast Texas, a little bit into central Texas. Uh, again, this is a situation there that I know that there are Carl snakes in and around our county. Uh, very, very rare to find this snake, uh, especially where we're at. It's not impossible, uh, and they are here, but it's very, very rare. But just for reference there, uh, one of our eight snakes here uh, that I included is this one here. Okay, the copperhead, uh, Echistrodon contortix, obviously a venomous snake. We already talked about this being a pit viper. Uh, copperheads and humans, they lead to common accidental encounters, obviously. And I already talked about our two species that we have here in Texas, our eastern and broadband copperhead. Uh, this is the taxonomy uh, for the copperhead. Uh, to me, this is very interesting. I know this is kind of dry, but this is kind of cool to me. Obviously, we have an animal here, just like we are. We are belong to the same kingdom. Uh, and then we break this down to phylum. This is chordata. So these are animals with spinal cords. This includes invertebrates. Okay. Then we have a subphylum, which we go into our uh, vertebrates. Okay, this removes all our invertebrates. And uh, down from that, we have class. So now we are into reptiles. So we've now removed us as human beings from this. Uh, and so mammals and things like that. So now we're into reptiles. 
We go one down from reptiles, we have Ardor. Uh, this is a Squamata. This would include all of our snakes and lizards in this order. Uh, and then we go down to a sub order, Serpentes. This would now remove the lizards from us, from these snakes. So now we're talking about snakes only when we get the sub order. We're into Serpentes. Then we go to family. And so as we talked about, we're into the family Viper Day, our pit viper. And we're into the subfamily Crotalin, okay, or Crotalinae, or Crotalid. And now we're to the genus Echistrodon. And we're now to the species Echistrodon contortrix. So this is how this would break down and how the scientist would classify uh, these snakes. So. I know that's kind of dry. I, I kind of like the way they do this. I think it's pretty cool the way this all came about. So just to point out uh, how we look at a copperhead. Okay, so adult copperheads, they're gonna, uh, okay, go ahead. Enough. Yeah, someone asked if you could go back to the slide before that last one, so go back to. Right here? Go one more, or no, I, yeah, I guess it's that one. They didn't ask a question, they just said, can we switch back to that? Okay. You want to look at it more fine? Yeah, maybe somebody's writing something down. Yeah, so let me go ahead and ask uh, another question. Uh, someone found a Texas coral snake last week that had been hit by a car. Yes. The husband wanted to look at its rear facing fangs. Can you elaborate on that? And the snake is in their freezer now. Uh, okay, well, so we have a, a Texas coral snake, which is an elapidae, and we have a pit viper, which obviously is a, you know, a viper day. The characteristic of the fangs of the pit viper is that it, it has a hinged uh, set of fangs. And when the snake closes its mouth, if you look at this one here, the mouth is open, the, the fangs are gonna hinge forward when it closes its mouth, the fangs of the viper are going to fold back into its mouth and it's going to close its mouth. So you can imagine a fulcrum there of a, of a, of a hinged fang situation that we have with a copperhead. When we're talking about an elapidae, like the Texas coral snake, we have a set of fixed fangs in its mouth. And so those fangs, when it opens its mouth, it does not hinge out. Uh, like you would see in a pit viper. Uh, in a uh, coral snake, they are not a rear fang snake. They are a front fanged, fixed fanged snake. So uh, I did not include a picture of that. I do have one, uh, but uh, a couple things. If he's looking at the fangs of a dead snake, I would be extremely careful what you're doing, number one because that snake is still capable of, of uh, you know, like I think I said before, you just need a scratch. You know, if you make a mistake, you're going to get envenomated. So it's not something I would mess with. But if he wanted to do that, and he did open the dead snake's mouth, he would see a set of fixed front fangs in the uh, coral snake. I guess, I don't know if I answered that, but that's my answer. <laughs> okay, someone else was then asking, would you go in depth about some of the other myths about coral snakes, like chewing to envenomate or rear yeah, facing, so, thing, et cetera? Yeah, so one of the myths is that in order to be envenomated by a coral snake, uh, they need to latch on like between your fingers uh, and, uh, and chew on you in order to envenomate you. That is, that is also a myth. Uh, that, is, that is not true. You just need to get bit, that's it. Uh, some of the other myths when we go back to the coral snake. Let me go back here. Um, look at, so uh, if you see here the coral snake picture here, uh, this isn't a myth, this is kind of a rhyme, okay? So as we looked at the coral snake, the general rhyme is uh, red touching yellow will kill a fellow, red touching black is a friend to Jack. That's just something to remember when you're out in the field. Uh, that is probably okay to depend on here in Central Texas. Uh, you can see clearly from the snake's bands that uh, 
the red band is touching the yellow band, okay? As opposed to a milk snake, uh, we would see uh, the red band touching black bands. Uh, now, the red touching yellow will kill a fellow rhyme is not reliable in Florida, and it's not reliable on the Mexican, Texas, Trans-Pecos areas because there are very, very many aberrant uh, coral snakes that don't exhibit this pattern at all. And you can get yourself in a world of trouble uh, if you're re relying on that rhyme. So the rhyme is useful sort of up here, uh, not completely, but it is not something that I would depend on, uh, uh, you know, everywhere in the country, okay? And certainly not down in, the, in Mexico, South America, and South, you know, South areas of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you know, I guess three myths is that the snake has to grab onto you and chew in order to envenomate you. That is not true. Uh, you know, uh, myth number two would be that this is a, a rear fang snake. It is a, not a rear fanged snake. It is a front fanged, fixed fanged snake as opposed to a pit viper hinged fanged snake. And then, as I mentioned, the, the rhyme, those would be the three that I would look at, unless someone has another one that they wanna bring out. Okay. Okay, and that call, or the person that wanted you to go back has said thank you, so I guess she's done. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, adult copperheads uh, grow to lengths of, you know, about 40 inches or so, something like that, a little over between three and four feet, something like that. It has a stout body, the head is broad. You can see this, I mean, it's got a kind of a big head. And it's distinct from the neck, so you can see here, it's it kind of tapers down really quickly to the neck. The color pattern can be a pale to pinkish tan or a ground color. And as we go up here, this part of the snake here, up closer to the midline of the snake, it becomes darker when we go to this range here, up to the top. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, the cross bands here are light tan to pinkish tan to pale brown in the center. And then if you, this is a good example here, you can see that towards the edges of the pattern here, it kind of darkens, okay, as we get toward the edges. And in this particular case, we have a juvenile snake here, as you can clearly see here on the tail, uh, a snake that is probably six months to a year, less than two years old here, that's still exhibiting this yellow caudal tail. Okay. So copperheads, they, uh, they are in a variety of different habitats here in uh, North Texas. They uh, favor deciduous forests, and mixed woodlands. We find them a lot in rock out outcroppings, and a lot on ledges, rock ledges. We can even find these guys in low-lying swampy regions. We can find them. We can find them in... Uh, in the configurous forests. These snakes are highly adaptable to living in, in human habitations. They freely live in congested human areas. And here in Flower Mound, I could go uh, a few football fields away and I'm gonna find a copperhead here. It's just no question about it. They, they are pretty much everywhere, okay? Uh, as I showed you before, the ranges that I showed you of the copperhead, these are generally the snakes, the states where these snakes are going to range. <clears throat> I count here 27 states in the United States that are home range to copperheads. So you know, over 50% of our states, uh, you'll be able to find a copperhead of some kind. Okay. Uh, somebody asked this question, a copperhead is generally an ambush predator. It will take a promising position and it'll sit there and wait for a suitable prey to arrive. Now, one of the things that snakes will do, and we didn't talk about this, but their, their tongues, they use their tongue to, for lack of a better word, it's not really what it does, but we're gonna call it smelling, okay? And they can use that tongue to sense uh, rodent trails. 
where the rodents come back and forth. So they kind of know where that's at. And they'll sit at those trails where they're confident that these, uh, they're confident that these, uh, I should have, I should have taken care of that problem. So, you know, uh, they'll, they'll sit, they'll sit in a, in a position and they'll wait for a, a mouse or a frog to come by and then they'll grab it. <laughs> there is one exception and that is when copperheads feed on insects such as caterpillars or freshly molted cicadas. Cicadas are the fast food of the copperhead world. So when copperheads are hunting, uh, when I spelled hunting wrong, I apologize for that. When copperheads are hunting insects, or copperheads are hunting um, cicadas, they are no longer an ambush predator. They are a pursuer of these guys. And you will find them in the summer when you start hearing the cicadas coming out, you will find them actively hunting for cicadas. And they will gorge themselves on cicadas. OK, as I mentioned, uh, a juvenile will have a brightly colored yellow tail. This is used to attract frogs and lizards and other insects. This is called caudal luring. During the uh, hot summer months, these snakes will be nocturnal. If I go out at nine o'clock at night on the trails here around Flower Mound in Denton County, I'm going to encounter a lot of copperheads. Uh, during the springtime and the fall, uh, they're commonly active also during the day. But obviously, when it gets hot, they're trying to cool down, being a cold-blooded animal. OK, copperhead, the copperhead behavior. They prefer to avoid humans at every opportunity. And they may leave the area without biting. And pretty much most snakes will do that. They prefer to go stage left. They want to get out of the way. <clears throat> they do not like being anywhere near or around humans. I'm going to show you another video in a minute. We'll see if it works and you'll see what I'm talking about. There also is the situation where copperheads being an ambush predator, they also at, from time to time will freeze instead of slithering away. This results in a lot of bites to people because they unknowingly cannot see the copperhead. They don't know where it's at and they'll step on it or they'll reach into something and the result will be they'll be bitten. So. Uh, this freeze tendency that we see in copperheads, it, it likely evolved because of their effectiveness of their camouflage. And we're going to show some of that here. <clears throat> when uh, lying in dead leaves or red clay, these copperheads, it's very hard to see them. They're almost un unnoticeable. Uh, again, they may flee. Uh, they may stay. Uh, frequently, they will stay still until they're approached. And they generally will not strike. Uh, if you happen to come in contact with one, uh, it, it will bite or will, you know, most likely try to bite. Then we go back to the whole thing. Did you get a dry bite or did you get envenomated? We don't know. You know, we have to see what happens there. Uh, whether the snake bites, whether it flees, uh, whether it stays still, this is highly dependent on that particular snake's personality. So believe it or not, every, every one of them is different. And they may do different things just because they're grumpy, they're having a bad day, you know, whatever. You know, their wife is yelling at them, who knows, okay? But uh, anyway, uh, you know, it just sort of depends on what they do. Things I've learned about snakes, they're very much like children. They don't listen very well. So check a question. Yep. <clears throat> you mentioned that snake bite in Texas is generally not fatal. Yes. But yep. is body size a variable in that that makes a difference. But individuals thinking about their five granddaughters who love to run all over their wooded backyard. Uh, if I understood the question, is she, is she talking about, okay, so I, I guess I'll answer this in two ways. <clears throat> body size of the, of the human. Yeah, obviously a child, uh, due to its size, you know, um, the, the venom is going to react to the human body the same way whether you're an adult or you're a child. It is, it's, it's hemotoxic and it's going to destroy tissue. Um, obviously, a smaller person you know, may, may see more destruction. That's why it's important to get to the hospital. 
uh, you know, it just sort of depends. I can't really answer that. Uh, on the flip side of that, an adult, you know, when we get to our age, we may have some other medical conditions that may contribute to additional problems that maybe we didn't see with a younger younger person. Uh, things like heart disease or hypertension or whatever else that, that you might have. I know I got a whole boatload of that stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, that's kind of hard to answer. Uh, and, and that's why you need to get to the hospital as soon as, as soon as you can in this situation. And I'm going to cover that as well. Okay. Another sure couple, completely. Yeah, another couple of questions that whether now or later, uh, how can you tell a dry bite from a venomous bite? Well, what's going to happen is my suggestion is whether you or when you're bitten by the snake, you get yourself to a hospital. What's going to happen there is uh, they're going to do labs. They're going to take your blood. Uh, and then we are going to, uh, we, the, the, the doctors are going to monitor progression of venom. So let's say you get bit on the, fi on the finger. <clears throat> when, we, when, when the doctor starts to see uh, the condition of uh, hemotoxic toxicity and systemic toxicity, things like, uh, and I'm gonna show you another slide on this too. A lot of this I have here. Uh, you may exhibit things like lower blood pressure, dizziness, diarrhea, other kind of systemic indications that you receive venom. And you're, you're gonna see hemotoxic toxicity where you're gonna see massive swelling start to take place in your joints. In other words, you got bit in the finger, or uh, you get bit on the foot and your ankle starts to swell up like a football. Okay, then we know you've been envenomated. If you haven't been envenomated, you might get bit on the foot and we don't see any swelling in your uh, extremities. So the, the doctors should track the progression of venom and when they see venom progressing, uh, and that will be indicated by swelling, they will know that you have received venom and it is appropriate to begin anti-venom. And does wearing leather gloves help prevent being envenomated? Well, everything helps. Uh, you know, it, it uh, obviously depends on a lot there, the thickness, you know, uh, you know, you, uh, I think I mentioned before, at, at times a snake will strike at you and not even bite you. They'll just hit you within your nose just as a warning. I wouldn't count on that, but um, I'd say, you know, obviously, you know, that, that, that's kind of up in the air because I don't know what kind of gloves you're talking about, the thickness of the gloves. But my general comment is, sure, any, anything helps. You know, it could, it could help deflect the bite. Uh, can a pit viper bite through something like that? Uh, probably yes. All right. And what are the common predators of these snakes besides us? Uh, well, you know, well, obviously uh, many birds of prey, eagles, owls, roadrunners, uh, possums, uh, coyotes, uh, you know, every, you know, a lot of, a lot of things like that. But it, they do provide uh, egrets, you know, herons, uh, things like that. So they do, they do provide a, a, a valuable food uh, source for birds of prey and other mammals in the food chain. And is loose clothing a better choice if you're going to be in snake country? Um, I don't personally worry about that. Uh, generally, I wear either jeans or I have some fatigues, kind of like combat fatigues from the military that I wear when I'm out in the field. Um, I wouldn't count on that, put it that way. That's why we make things uh, that you see out there, especially with rattlesnakes. You'll see cowboys, you know, wearing pants, but they also wear chaps, things like that, snake boots. I don't personally do that, but you know, you, you, you know a good pair of boots and a thick pair of clothing or some kind of chaps, if you're concerned about that, that, that you know, you could do that. I personally do not. Okay, that it? We're gonna move on? Yep. Let's talk about camouflage. Um, I don't need an answer here, but can you see the snake in the photo? 
So if anybody cannot, and I know this might be hard, here he is right here, you can see him coming down here. This is why these guys are so incredibly hard to see. Okay. Uh, another picture here. Uh, this one in the center is an enlargement of this one to the left. Here you can see the copperhead here, and here's an enlargement of the same picture. So you can see walking through the forest, <clears throat> this is going to be pretty hard to see. Okay. Here's a, a situation, a little bit easier to see, but this would be a, a copperhead here on a sandy, uh, more uh, yellowish, uh, dry looking area here where kind of a little bit easier to see, but not, not, not quite as bad. So camouflage is an important part of, of this. Uh, here is one of the copperheads that we found in Flower Mound. Kind of the demonstration here is one to look at the color of the copperhead. This is a very beautifully colored snake. Uh, but the other thing to notice about this is again, I talked about what are snakes wanting to do. In this particular case, you will notice this snake has only one agenda and his snake, his agenda is to get away from me. He is headed in the absolute opposite direction than I am. So he's not coming at me. He's not trying to bite me. Uh, you know, he just says, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if this guy is trying to eat me. Uh, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. I do know one thing. My best thing to do is just get out of the way. So this is what this copperhead here is doing here. This again was in Flower Mound. Uh, this is really, this really was a beautiful snake. And that's one of the reasons I did this because his coloring, the, the, the copper and the, and the brownness of the snake was striking. They are really beautiful snakes. So you can see here that, you know, when we talk about, are they gonna, is this snake gonna chase me? Is this snake gonna come after me? This is generally the behavior that you're gonna see when the snake is in this kind of situation. Obviously, there's no camouflage here. There's no way the snake is thinking that I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, try to blend in. It kind of knows that here. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, agenda here is I need to get as far away from this human being as I possibly can. Now, in some cases, what you see here is he's starting to come towards me. It's not that he's chasing me. He's trying to look for another escape route. And he may have thought that my body was actually a log or something that he can hide at. So if a snake comes at you, it's not that he's chasing you or he's trying to attack you or he's being aggressive. He's looking for a place to hide. And that's exactly what we saw here. I hope you were able to see that okay. Okay, let's to, go. go ahead. Yeah, uh, on your previous slide that had the three pictures of coral snakes in the camouflage, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, copperheads. Uh, copperheads. Yeah. Question was, uh, was any of them hybrid? Uh, the one on the right uh, is, is definitely a broadband. Uh, the one in the other one, uh, I would call that an Eastern copperhead. That, that looks pretty much, it's kind of weird. That does have a little bit of a weird marking. It, the Hershey Kiss part of it is kind of cut off on the top. I think this is just a, in, in, an individual uh, genetic trait in that particular snake. Uh, but I would call this one an Eastern and the one on the right a, a, a broadband. Okay, any more? Okay. I think she was thinking or didn't know that the center one was just a close up of the picture. Yeah, that was, that was a close up of the other one, yeah. So feeding, what do copperheads eat? So 90% of a copperhead's diet, it consists of rodents, small rodents, like mice and voles, occasional rat, if they're big enough. Uh, copperheads also search for frogs, toads, and insects. Uh, although these are highly terrestrial snakes, copperheads have been known to climb trees. Here's an example here. I found several copperheads in trees, especially when the cicadas come out. So copperheads, when they hunt for cicadas, we, you will readily find them in trees. They're not great climbers. No pit vipers are great climbers. Like a rat snake would be an outstanding climber, which you can find anywhere. Um, but uh, you know, generally, these pit vipers do not climb unless they are in this kind of situation where they're foraging for cicadas. 
So when we get here into June around uh, July and parts of August and we start hearing the cicadas, um, you know, a lot of times I'm looking for copperheads, I'm looking on the ground. Well, when I hear cicadas, I'm looking in the trees. And not really high up in the trees, although they can. I'm talking about a foot or two or three feet or so into the trees. So copperheads breed in late summer. Uh, females will not breed every year. We're talking about reproduction now. A female uh, can produce several young uh, and for, for years uh, you know, running. So they may not breed all the time, but they could still produce young. And uh, they will have their young uh, coming up here pretty soon, May. And then they will have young again in like October, uh, just depending on the snake. Uh, generally, they give birth to uh, live young, so they're ovoviviparous. And uh, you were going to see uh, uh, maybe a litter of uh, four, five, six, seven, eight snakes. And uh, they're going to average about eight inches long of babies. Good picture here of the caudal tail that we were referring to before with the baby copperheads. Okay, several questions have come up about this. You were just bitten by a copperhead. Now what happens next? Okay. Well, first of all, something you need to know that deaths from copperhead bite, they are virtually non-existent. However, about 7,000, 8,000 people are bitten by venomous snakes each year in the U.S. Half of those bites come from this single species, the copperhead. Uh, of note, there has never been a death recorded from a copperhead bite in Texas, ever, in the recorded time that we've kept track of this. There have been one or two people die from a venomous copperhead bite in other states other than Texas, but not in Texas. At a general uh, death rate in the entire state, uh, when, we, when we lump in uh, rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths, there's going to be one or two people each year that die of uh, a venomous snake bite in Texas and most likely from uh, a rattlesnake. <clears throat> to keep this in perspective, nine people in, in uh, the United States will be killed by lightning this year. So it, you kind of have to put this, this in perspective, okay? By the way, good picture here of the pit that we talked about before right here. Uh, on the dry bites, yes, about 25% of venomous snake bites in the U.S. are dry bites. But I wouldn't count on that. Um, so the, uh, the best bet is to not get bit at all. But um, you can uh, be assured that not every bite from a venomous pit viper, uh, you are going to get venom. Uh, so if you get bit, make no mistake by a copperhead, this can be a significant medical event. Um, snake bite victims, we see this all too often, deal with inexperienced medical personnel when they arrive at the hospital and they, they're looking for snake bite treatment. The reason for this is uh, this is relatively uncommon occurrence compared to other things that emergency personnel learn about and treat. So really snake bite in the entire career of being trained may take up an hour of your training, if that. So it's not something that they know much about. Um, you should get to the closest appropriate medical facility as soon as possible. Somebody asked a question about who has antivenom and who doesn't. I mentioned that that is really not a consideration. What is a consideration is you get to the closest appropriate medical facility so you can be stabilized because you may have some other things going on. Uh, your blood pressure may drop. You may get dizzy. You may get nauseous. nauseous. Uh, you know, so you may have some other things going on. So my advice is to get to the closest medical facility and become stabilized. And then the, the medical personnel can determine if you need antivenom. And if they don't have it there, they can quickly get it and administer it uh, as needed. But get there as soon as you can. If you are unfortunate enough to be out on the field and you get bit, uh, if you can take a photograph of the snake, that is great, but it's not necessary. Uh, also, never, 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 I can't say this enough, never bring a snake, alive or dead, with you to the hospital. 
okay? Uh, be aware that pit viper envenomations, they account for about 98% of all native envenomations in the US. So we really do not need to know what you got bit by. In the very rare event that you get bit by a coral snake, um, you know, that, that's kind of a different story, but the, the aim of this presentation is really on the copperhead cotton mouse, okay? Uh, so, as I mentioned before, when we talked about the curlfab antivenom, the reason we don't need to really particularly know what pit fiber bit you uh, is because this is a polyvalent antivenom and it is effective for all of our pit vipers. So we don't necessarily need to know we're going to assume you've been bitten by a pit viper. You're going to see a couple pictures here of some bites. So if uh, you don't want to see this, I understand. Just look away or whatever. Uh, so if you're bitten by a pit viper, uh, this is going to be characterized by a combination of local tissue damage and hemotoxic toxicity and systemic toxicity. When we talk about this, as I said, and I'll show you another picture in a second, you're going to see some other, um, some other uh, symptoms of what's going on with your body. One of the symptoms is you're going to start to see this swelling uh, as the venom progresses up into your joints. In this particular case, um, this guy, one of the things that's going wrong with this picture, and I don't know why, the, why or when the picture was taken, but if you're bitten by a copperhead, we do not want your hand in this position. We want your hand above the level of your heart. <clears throat> so in this particular picture, this guy's holding his hand, and I don't know whether he's in a, it looks like he maybe he's at home. <clears throat> but the reason that we want your hand or your affected extremity uh, if, uh, elevated above the level of your heart is that this will decrease the amount of tissue damage that you're experiencing uh, and the venom won't pool down into that area and all that is going to do in the position he has his hand right now is going to exasperate uh, the damage that his tissues are going through so we want that elevated as i said here in the middle there which i just said by far the most common manifestation is the damage of your tissues. Uh, so 95% uh, of uh, the time you get bit, you're gonna have swelling, tenderness, and bruising if you're envenomated. Some of this has to do with how much venom you receive. Someone may be asking the question, and this comes up every time, well, gee, I understand the babies are more dangerous than the, <coughs> than the adults because they can't control their venom. Uh, that is not true. That's another snake myth. So the bigger the snake, uh, the bigger the venom, uh, the more venom they carry in their venom glands, the bigger their fangs. Uh, the, the myth that babies can't control their venom, and even if that were true, if a baby unloaded all its venom all at one time into your body, it's a small snake. It has a small venom gland, and it contains a small amount of venom. So whether they can control it or not, it's a really an insignificant fact. You are much better getting bit by a baby than you are getting bit by an adult. So Mike, I'm gonna grab a, a thing of water. Can you give me like two seconds? Sure. Okay, I'm back. Good time to ask about any questions. Yeah, uh, someone had asked about myths with young snakes and adults, okay. though they had heard that young <laughs> yeah, venom was not, not as powerful. Yeah, that's a very common misconception. And I must say that when you get on the social sites here, uh, that is a constant source of battle between people trying to, you know, they, they read something and then they, you know, there's really almost nothing more full of incorrect information than what you see in the snake world. All right, someone's also asking about a snake bite 911 app. Uh, I have information on that here. So okay. just stay with me. All right. 
Okay. Uh, so what we find out, unfortunately, is that many venomous snake bite patients, they don't get treated with anti-venom in the hospital. Okay. This is a statement here I haven't read that, that we should all remember. <coughs> with only rare exceptions, pit viper envenomations should be treated with anti-venom. Okay. Uh, and this is also two statements here that we already talked about, the difference between Crofab and Anavip, Anavip um, antivenom. So unfortunately, we see this too much. Okay, you're out in the field, you've been bit by a copperhead. What should you avoid? Well, first of all, do not use tourniquets. Uh, a tourniquet is only going to increase the amount of tissue damage that you're going to experience here. Uh, let's say you get a bit on the arm, uh, a tourniquet is going to cause more problems. Uh, do not use any kind of extraction devices, cutting or applying suction to the bite site. Uh, snake bite kits, the best thing you could do with a snake bite kit is throw it away. It is completely useless. Don't buy them. It's another scam out there. They don't do anything. Do not put ice or cold packs on the affected area. Again, I'm speaking about pit vipers only here. Uh, it may be uh, beneficial if you did get a carl snake bite uh, to do that, but as far as a pit viper goes, we don't want to put any cold on it. Um, do not use anything like Advil or Motrin or any other kind of anti-inflammatory drug. Once again, that will only exacerbate the tissue problems that you're experiencing. Uh, antibiotics. There's no reason to take an antibiotic from a snake bite unless you develop an infection. Infection from snake bite is extremely rare. So because of, we have this uh, problem with antibiotics that we take too many antibiotics and we're developing resistances, these bugs are. <clears throat> unless there is an infection present, there's no reason to take an antibiotic. Uh, do not use electric shock. That is some ridiculous thing that people used to do back in the old days. Do not use any blood products. <clears throat> there is a, uh, a process called a fasciotomy, and a surgeon uh, sees a condition called compartment syndrome, <clears throat> where your uh, pressures build up in, the, in your tissues. And a surgeon will come in and perform surgery to remove the pressures. Uh, if that ever happens to you and you're in a hospital and, a, and they bring in a surgeon to talk to you, my advice is to pack your stuff up and leave that hospital. There's absolutely no reason with a snake bite to get a, to have surgery, okay? The way to treat a snake bite is with antivenom, not surgery. Do not attempt to capture, kill, or transport the snake to the hospital please. Okay, what do you do? Well, you're out in the field. Uh, hopefully you have your cell phone. Call 911. Okay. There's a, a, a very well-known saying here in the snake business, time is tissue. So the delays in treatment can lead to further tissue damage. So you need to get to the hospital as soon as possible. Remove constrictive items, jewelry, tight-fitting clothes, shoes, if you're bit on the finger or the hand and your hand swells up and you have a ring on, they're going to cut that off. So better to remove it before you, you swell up. Um, recommend that if you have your cell phone and one person here mentioned uh, snake bite 911 and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but if you could track the spread of the venom every 15 minutes by taking a photo with your phone that could be helpful. So you get bit on the finger, you take a picture of it, you wait 10 or 15 minutes, take another picture of it, wait 10 or 15 minutes, take another picture of it. That could save some valuable time when you get to the hospital and the physician or your emergency room treatment person can see clearly in the pictures that you took that you definitely have been envenomated and venom is, is spreading to your joints. Okay, I mentioned before, a pit viper envenomation, keep the bitten limb if possible, raised to the level above your heart. Okay, so if you're bitten on the arm or the hand, that's easy to do. If you're bitten on the foot and you have to walk out of the forest, that could be a little harder to do. But again, go back to, you need to get yourself to the hospital. So the, you know, the downside is, you know, you need to get out of there and get to some medical personnel as soon as possible. So you just have to walk, okay? 
Uh, if you're with somebody, keep the victim as still as possible if you can. Moving around will also uh, increase the, 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 um, the movement of the venom in your system. And uh, if you carry, if you are able to call, call poison control, uh, this is the phone number for poison control. We're gonna also talk about this in a minute in the relation to a few other things. So a lot of people ask me, okay, um, a lot of people say, and we see this in, in the emergency rooms and the hospitals, a lot of people, they might not be treated because of these bites. And, and why is that? Well, one of the reasons is physicians not being that familiar with this situation, they think that snake bites are not that serious. And in the past, copperheads have been kind of looked at like, uh, oh, you get bit by a copperhead, it's really not that venomous. So, you know, it'll, it'll leave your body. So just don't worry about it. Uh, and here's some, here's some asp you know, aspirin or here's some, uh, you know, some other uh, uh, drug to take to, to handle the pain. So you know, they may not think it's that serious a situation. I can assure you that it is a pretty serious situation. Uh, a physician may not believe that antivenom is effective. That's another problem. Uh, they also may not think that antivenom is, is safe. In the past, that was uh, possibly true. Uh, people do have anaphylactic reactions from either venom or antivenom. This is extremely rare. And if you're in the hospital and you do have a reaction to venom or antivenom, you are in the right place. And as I said before, the treatment to a reaction to either one of these situations is going to be epinephrine. Uh, and they also may not think that treatment with antivenom is worth the cost. That brings up another issue. I'm not really going to cover that, but antivenom is expensive. I do have a saying that you all need to keep in mind if you're worried about the cost of something like this in the unfortunate event that you do get envenomated. And that saying is, antivenom is very expensive, but so is permanent disability. And that goes into the thinking that if you're envenomated, you need to have antivenom, okay? Here on the right, these are the general symptoms of snake bite. I alluded to some of these things that could, may or may not be happening to your body when this happens. But uh, again, you can, uh, you can uh, experience dizziness and fainting, thirst, you can get a headache, blurred vision, a fever, obviously pain, some difficulty breathing. At the wound site, you're gonna see bleeding and fang marks and discoloration. It's gonna hurt like hell. When you get bit by a venomous snake, it's gonna be a feeling that you've never experienced before. We've had a few people in our chapter bitten by snakes and they can tell you. Um, you might get numbness, you're going to sweat, uh, rapid heartbeat, low blood pressure, you may go into shock, uh, you may vomit, you may get nausea, you may get diarrhea. So a lot of these things are possible. And so you just need to be aware if you're out there in the field that these things are all things that could happen. Okay, I get this asked Question. a lot, going into what some people asked. What does Chuck do? Okay. Well, here's what I do. Chuck is always snake aware when he's out in the field uh, continually. Um, if you want to learn and be proficient, uh, just work on and learn as much as you can and try to be proficient in snake identification so you know what's out there. Now, I carry with me this document here that you see uh, posted here. I know it's kind of hard to see. This is called the Unified Treatment Algorithm for the Management of North American Pit Viper Envenomations. This is kind of a flow chart, okay? And I carry this document in my uh, backpack, and I also carry this document in my glove compartment. And were I to get to an emergency room, I would take this out and I would give it to the people treating me and say to them, I would like you to follow this procedure because I don't know the foggiest idea what these people know about snake bite. This will give the physician a complete flow chart of what to look for and what to do next. And so this is why I carry this with me at all times when I'm out in the field. For example, when I was uh, photographing that cotton mouth that you saw and I was on my, my stomach two or three feet away from him, this was in my book bag in case I had to ran into a, a problem here and I had to get to a hospital. So uh, I'm thinking about, uh, and we can discuss this, uh, Brenda, uh, maybe this is something that we could put on 
our site or website that people have access to this. Um, so at any rate, uh, this is a very good document to, to carry around with you. Chuck, a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, someone was asking whether elevation of an extremity that's been bitten should be delayed until antivenom has started the no. IV because their contention would be that elevation would initially allow the distribution of the anticoagulant to spread. Uh, no, you need, you want, you want to, you want to as much as possible elevate. So, so we got, we got two things going on because of the hemotoxicity. Okay, it's, you know, it's, it's basically destroying your blood, but it's also causing a lot of tissue damage. So, you know, we, we want the elevation to lessen the amount of tissue damage that you're going to see. Again, what we see a lot of is permanent damage to the tissue or numbness or things like that that you get after the, the bite. So as much as possible, you should be elevating it both on the way to the hospital and definitely when you get to the hospital. Uh, and I have photos that I, I don't have in this presentation that shows <clears throat> the uh, proper way to elevate a limb. We see this time and time and time again when I see photos of people that are in the hospital with this and their limbs are not elevated properly. Uh, and so maybe their arm is laying on a pillow or something like that, it needs to be uh, extremely elevated and straight. If anyone is interested and they wanted to email me, I could forward them pictures of what it should look like. But to, to kind of answer that question, uh, the, the more the elevation, the better. Okay. And another question is how far can a copperhead strike? Uh, about, uh, I would say about one third to one half of its body length, uh, depending on the snake. Uh, so, you know, you're, uh, in general, if you encounter a copperhead and you take two or three steps back, uh, again, they're, they're very reluctant to do that. If you approach them and you try to grab them or you have a stick in your hand, which I don't recommend, they're going to strike. But if you just come upon one and you take a couple steps back, you're, you're totally safe. And that copperhead is then either going to remain still and hope and pray that you don't see it, or it's gonna flee the other direction. One of those two things are gonna happen. Okay, uh, again, back to what I do. Uh, I also have this phone number for poison control in my cell phone, 1-800-222-1222. On the algorithm sheet that I showed you previously that I carry in my car and in my backpack, this number is also at the bottom of that page, okay? You need to make sure the hospital and your treating physician, doctor, whatever, is also in contact with poison control. And they will help that doctor through this process. Uh, so the more people we have trying to help you, the better off you're gonna be. So keep, keep a note of poison control. Someone mentioned uh, Snakebite 911. What do I do? I have this application called Snakebite 911 on my cell phone. This is an app and it can educate you about North American pit vipers. It could also help you track the progression of the bite, which is kind of cool. So as I talked about taking a picture every 10 to 15 minutes, this app will also have a way for you to track progression of the venom by doing the same thing. It's actually pretty good. It will also help you find nearby hospitals so you can be prepared wherever you're at. You might not know, but it will be in here. I can't guarantee that if it tells you go to hospital A, B, or C, that that hospital carries antivenom. I don't know that, uh, but um, you know it does give you hospitals. It does include some life-saving tips and tools uh, that you can use, and it's very good for first responders. Um, can use it. Emergency room health professionals can use it. Outdoor enthusiasts can use it. I would recommend that if you're out in the field, this is a, a really good a way to stay prepared and to give you some knowledge. So I would, I would definitely do that. Uh, the other thing I do is I'm a member of this site on Facebook called National Snakebite Support. <clears throat> if you are concerned about this and you are in a situation where you're bit by a snake, um, you uh, can depend on these people. Uh, they will um, 
tell you exactly what should be happening and give you the proper management of a snake bite and venomation. They will also talk directly to the people that are treating you. These are a whole bunch of toxicologists and doctors that treat snake bites. Uh, so this is the whole purpose of this is to get snake bite victims connected with experts who practice the proper management of snake envenomations. So this is found on Facebook. Just search National Snake Bite Support. And not only if you want to learn about snakes and snake bite, this is an invaluable source because you can follow along with what's happening with these different cases, which I do. And when, when somebody gets bit by a snake, they shut the, uh, the comments down so you can't comment, but you can read what's going on. So it's really a fascinating site. Uh, so if you get a, want to do that, you can join that site. Okay, uh, Brent, how much time do we have left, Brenda? Are we over time? Can you hear me? Hello? I think we're at the two hour mark, so. Okay, I'm just gonna really quick uh, run through this if we have people left, because this has come up uh, a bit here. I call this part Paradise Lost or how to keep snakes away, or at least let's give it your best shot, okay? Uh, but we have to be okay uh, with snake that shows up in your yard anyway. So uh, homeowners, we live in a lot of rural areas. We encounter a lot of snakes. Most of them are harmless. Venomous encounters with copperheads, they're very common in North Texas. Uh, snakes, their behavior, like any other animal, it's centered around food. So if you look at some of these photos, you see some beautiful yardscapes. Uh, but in the center, in this particular one, this is a copperhead I found in a person's yard. It's hanging out in a bunch of mint. Uh, and if they were out there cleaning up their mint, they probably would have got bit. Uh, here's uh, more beautiful yards. Here's a snake in the tree. Uh, so the more we have these beautiful areas, the more we're going to bring, bring in food sources for snakes. Um, some more yards. Here's one that I found right by uh, a guy's uh, water cutoff here for his uh, water. This is right next to his foundation. So here's what we need to do. If you uh, don't want to deal with this problem or at least as possible, we do not want to create a free lunch. We want to eliminate rodents and other food sources. We want, uh, you know, much of the snake, as I said, it's, it centers its activity around looking for food. The best way to keep the snake away is to keep rodents away from your yard. Sometimes the problem is your neighbors. So be aware of that. You could do everything you can, but if your neighbor's not keeping things up, uh, things could uh, fall into your yard. I recommend you keep dog food inside and keep your dog poop picked up. Guess what? Uh, rodents do eat dog poop and rodents attract snakes. Uh, this is a bad one because I got a bunch of bird feeders and we all love birds, but avoid using bird feeders, especially any that use seeds. However, if you do use bird feeders and the rodents come in to eat the seeds, the snakes are gonna come in to eat the rodents. Look for a good pest control company. Do not use any poison bait. If you see rodent burrows, you can use water to destroy them. Eliminate all food sources, fruits, nuts from trees, unsecured garbage, grease traps from the grill, etc. All those things are gonna draw it in. A habitat uh, is very important, landscaping, vegetation, very important part, uh, and this is all used by snakes. The right plants can provide cover and they can provide hunting opportunities for snakes. The plants we choose as homeowners, they are very pretty, but they give snakes the ideal spot to hide and hunt. And learn uh, ground flowering plants, the you know, uh, low to the ground flowering plants, we all choose those. Um, Things like lantana, for example, but just be aware that snakes love these things, okay? Uh, what can you do? Uh, the best thing to do is go natural, to work with native plants and landscaping that does not need a lot of water. Uh, do not provide an unintentional oasis for snakes in your backyard. Uh, go natural again, uh, design with natives. Cactuses and other plants that require less water is a good thing to do. Remove or replace lantana, rosemary, and similar heavily leafly shaded plants. I know we don't want to do that. If you do keep lantana and other plants like this, keep it well maintained and always remove leaf litter. 
change your watering schedule and only water as much as is needed. Do not overwater. Okay. Providing water sources can be a major source of snake encounters. Snakes need water. Like all animals and every animal will stop to take a drink. Replace any leaking hoses or spigots or anything else that's dripping. You can install critter ramps in your pools so that a critter or a snake, for example, has a way to get out of your pool once it gets in. Adjust your sprinklers to be efficient and eliminate any waste. Um, Snakes want to stay cool and they're going to spend much of their time trying to stay cool. So you can minimize shaded hiding spots. Choose plants that can be cut high off the ground. Hedges and rows of bushes along walls, they're notorious for providing shade. If you can't see uh, under the ground cover and under your bushes, it's time to cut them back. Rocks, 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 decorative rocks, rocks, they're a major source of snake human conflict. Uh, usually around swimming pools. If your stuff is deteriorating, try to fix it as soon as you can. Uh, rodent tunnels. Rodents build snakes for homes. Rodents dig tunnels. These are great opportunities. Also be aware of much of us have a concrete pad where we have our pool pumps or air conditioning units and we don't often go around those. Those are absolute snake magnets. Keep your yard clean. If the property is used to store junk, you can expect animals to move in. Unused pavers, tiles, wood piles, even pool toys, all kinds of things like that are going to attract snakes. Clean them out if you can. Um, also keep walkways clear. Some snake encounters happen when you don't expect it, like at your front door. If you have pots and plants, pull them away from the corners. Leave them as much space as possible between the pot and the wall. Avoid extra plant landscaping that does provide deep cover. Keep your decorations to a minimum. This is all stuff we don't want to do, but if we want snakes, uh, then do it. Uh, no free rent. You must keep up on your building maintenance. The greatest source of shelter for snakes is your house itself. Rodents can easily get into a faulty foundation and dig under a patio or otherwise create an access for a snake to move in. If you have a crack in your foundation, don't wait. Fix it immediately, please. Hey, you know what? Sometimes there's nothing you can do, okay? I love this picture here to the left. We're never gonna run into this, but it kind of illustrates. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Even if you do every single thing we talked about, snakes will still show up. You happen to live where there are a lot of snakes. Lastly, snakes are not out to get you. Remember, snakes are natural. It's a natural occurrence in Texas. Snake bites are almost never fatal. Accidental bites are very rare. The danger of snakes is mostly in our collective minds. Snakes are a part of American and Texas culture. Odds are you really don't have much to worry about as you think you do. Always remember, snakes do not want to meet with you either. I want to thank you all, and my last message is to you is to please be snake aware. Are you hungry? Uh, Chuck, I have one more question from Ellen. She wants to know if these snakes are social or solitary. Snakes are solitary. So once they are born, they are on their own. <clears throat> if you happen to see one or more snake together in the same spot, it's not that they're pals. It only means that their food sources are available for both snakes. We do see a very little bit of maternal instinct in Western diamondback rattlesnakes. Uh, in other words, they will hang out around their dens with the babies for a little bit longer. But for the most part, snakes are solitary and they live a life on their own. And Chuck, one comment that uh, Sue Yost made um, when you're talking about uh, avoiding bird seed for bird feeders. She talked about that there's hot pepper bird products that the mammals won't eat, but it doesn't bother the birds. That's correct. I, and I use that. Yes. So yeah, you, you, yeah, whatever you can do, you know, the point is, is that whenever you're attracting rodents into your yard, you're, you're, you're going to have snakes chasing the rodents. Thanks, Chuck. We're all the chat coming back about what a great presentation you did. We really great. appreciate you doing this for us. It was very informative.
You did give me the creeps when you were crawling through the to the uh, water moccasin. Yeah, well, sometimes you got to get close. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I need to get that close. <laughs> that's right. That's what people let me do.